Okay, no mai, haere mai, kia koutou katoa everyone. Uh, ko Caroline Orchiston Tokuengwa, ke te whare wānanga o Otako aho e Mahiana. Uh, my name is Caroline Orchiston. I work at the University of Otago at the Centre for Sustainability. And David Johnson and I are going to be talking through some of the work that we're doing um, and leading disciplinary theme four, which is part of the Quake Core 2 uh, research program. So over the next sort of 25 minutes or so, we're going to keep it fairly brief just to give you a, a taste of some of the work that we're planning to, to get underway um, in, in this D, what we call DT4. Um, this very much builds on um, work that we, we've been doing on what we used to call Flagship 5. So that was the Pathways to Societal Resilience program in, in Quake Core 1. So we're very much um, continuing and, and building on that platform. And just to help you visualize where we sort of fit within the, the broader Quake Core 2 framework, this is a rather mm, interesting um, sort of structural diagram, I guess, of the program. It's a work in progress. We are hoping to, to improve the way this looks. Um, as, a, as, a, as a communicator, I, quite, I find this a bit hard on my brain. But anyway, um, so you can see there are two sort of panels here. We've got the disciplinary themes here, which is very much where, we, where we're focusing on our disciplinary expertise around um, engineering, geoscience and social science in this program. And then as uh, of course, all of the cores are very interdisciplinary in nature. These, these interdisciplinary programs are where we very much work together in teams to target some of the, the big issues for, for Quake Core in our research. And so DT4 down here, critical social and cultural factors um, is very much very closely aligned with DT3. So many of our uh, flagship five uh, research partners are, are sitting in DT3. So we're actually having joint monthly meetings and we'd welcome any of you to come along or, or your colleagues invite, we invite you to take part in those monthly meetings. Um, if you do want to come along, we'll put your name on the mailing list. So just let uh, either David or, or me know if you'd like to come along. Um, I'm gonna hand over to David and he's gonna start talking through the first two um, research themes uh, for us on the program. Uh, thank you, Caroline, and welcome, everyone. It's nice to see some um, names and faces um, from people from the past and a few new names as well. So um, what we really do is just outline the thematic areas that we went into the bid um, and discuss some of the work we're doing. There'll be a chance later on we, we might call on some of you on the panel if we get any questions Um on this call to, to elaborate some of the work you're doing. But in, um, in the past, a number of us right across a number of disciplines have been really looking at trying to understand what people do at the point of earthquake shaking. Um, and we've came out of the Canterbury earthquake where we saw the impacts of the earthquake on people. But what we we're particularly interested in was the responses of individuals when the earth shakes, but also looking at how the, that human behavior made a difference, whether they were injured or not, and then the interface between that and the engineering environment. So I see Nick Horspils on this, and his sort of his PhD has been building on that. Very much, I think what was quite unique to New Zealand was the ability for us to draw together the medical data we had of the medical researchers, engineers, and the behavioral sciences. So we've done quite a lot of work that's been quite pioneering globally, looking at how people respond during earthquake shaking and what difference particular behaviors make. Um, and then taking an advance on that, the work, and I see Julie Becker's on this call, has been the promise or potential of earthquake early warnings, whether they be um, people's feeling the first shaking or um, an early warning system. And we've, we'll carry on some work looking at the potential and the sort of uh, some of the challenges we face with earthquake early warnings. Um, and one of the other parts of this is, is about how do we prepare people for earthquake shaking? So a lot of this work is around the shakeout exercise and asking questions, does that actually make a difference or not? Next slide, Caroline. Um, so this comes back in this actually, it was a photo I took in my son's school back in 20, 2006, and they were doing shakeout when before it was a national program. And one of the questions I asked these children here in this photo, and 
um, one of them, we can't show faces of children. So this was a very good photo and I've, it's been well used. I asked these kids, had any of you ever felt extre an extreme earthquake? And in 2006, earthquakes were not the lived experience of any of these children. Now, the subsequent Canterbury earthquakes in Kaikoura, that has changed. So as a nation, we have more people who have experienced earthquakes um, in the last decade than we have for the decade before. So one of the research questions we have is, what is the effect of the lived experience versus education and training? So there are many places in New Zealand that can have the potential for um, damaging or injury causing earthquakes who themselves have never experienced an, an earthquake. And we also have new immigrants to our country who may not come from seismically active areas, or we have people who are bringing their experience from elsewhere into us. So we're interested in that. Next slide. Sorry, this is coming. <laughs> um, and one of the things we've been looking at is both using the lived experience of people, and as I said, looking at the medical records, but we've been pioneering New Zealand work using CCTV to observe behaviours, and Lauren Vanell has been doing some very interesting work from the Kakura earthquake from CCTV footage that we got from the Wellington Airport. Next slide. Um, the second strand of work that I'm involved in with others, and I see Lauren's on there and Julia and many of us in the past, is looking at how people um, understand and interpret um, risk from making decisions, whether they be collective or individual about, um, and how does that um, lived experience of earthquakes shape perceptions of risk feeding into risk reduction policy. So what are the factors and how they vary over time and place because not everything is equal in terms of people's experience and the level of risk they face. Next slide. Um, as we know, if we were to ask people, and in fact, Julia Becker did the year before the Canterbury earthquake in Christchurch about perceptions of earthquake risk, it's significantly different if then afterwards even though that they've had an event, but we're interested how that lived experience shapes people's decision going forward. And then that gives us some insights to how do we address improving earthquake um, risk reduction activities or perceptions of risk in areas that have had less experience. So we're looking at some of the lower seismic hazard zones, Otago or Southland, or the Waikato, Auckland, or the Northland areas, where they have maybe not had and in some ways I say this cautiously, the luxury of passing earthquakes, because we wouldn't wish earthquakes on anyone, but they will happen. And how does that lack of or experience shape how they decide what to do about it? And how do we manage the different, the time varying risks that we face from earthquakes? Next slide. And obviously we have some future perils that we are facing and have to prepare for. So in Wellington, we have had some recent earthquakes um, from the crustal, but we have the subduction plate locked under us. And what does that mean in terms of moving forward, both from an engineering perspective, but also preparing society? Next. And just highlighting that, yes, we've done some previous earth building on really work of others about how the sort of spatial and temporal changes and perceived risk um, plays out in terms of our risk reduction activities, both individually and collectively, but also on the policy side as well. Next, I think over to you, Caroline. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so in terms of the third research objective of DT4, um, just, just sort of adding to what David said about, you know, the fact that New Zealand is now kind of considered a living laboratory of, of experience since 2010. You know, we've had a number of major events now, so we're, we've got an awful lot to, to learn from and, and leverage from those opportunities, I suppose. And so in recent years, we've seen a real explosion in the um, these types of uh, initiatives, which we're calling boundary organisations like East Coast Lab and like AF8 and other hazard initiatives to improve our national earthquake resilience. And just how, how is this being achieved? Can we uh, try and understand and evaluate the success of some of those programs? And at the moment, AF8 
um, has just had a, a, a program evaluation completed by a, a consultant and um, East Coast Lab is about to have the same um, piece of work uh, undertaken on, on its uh, program so far. And what we've learned from the AFA evaluation is an awful lot about our effectiveness, um, whether we've achieved our desired outcomes as, a, as, a, um, as, as an hazard initiative and the sort of impact and, and consequences of some of the work we've been doing. And it's really exciting to see that from a very independent perspective, the res, you know, um, evaluation research on these, uh, these sorts of um, efforts. And so we'd really like to build on that and to learn as much as we can from that. So how can we leverage and learn from these uh, resilience building initiatives to reduce risk from earthquake hazards? And uh, what we've learned, I suppose, over the last number of years is that effective risk communication uh, public education in schools and out in communities to empower people to take action are really, really important. And we need to understand the effectiveness of these types of efforts that we're making as well, so that we can really ensure that uh, people are able to take action. They're part of the conversation. They're empowered, empowered uh, to understand more about their local hazard risks so that they can get pre better prepared as families, as whānau, as, as businesses. And so there's a lot of work here that's that's really emerged in recent years, but it's important that we understand and assess those efforts so that we're doing the very, very best we can and that we're learning from those as we go along. And I think ShakeOut, as David mentioned, is a really interesting example. It's a sort of a global ph phenomenon now. It began in California. Um, New Zealand had its first ShakeOut in 2009 on the West Coast, and then it spread to a national uh, campaign in, in the years after that. And now it's an annual event. And so October the 28th this year is the, is the national shakeout. And we'd encourage all of you to sign up. Um, there's been an, a lot of research done by Julia Becker and, and her colleagues on the, uh, the, the shakeout campaign and understanding its effectiveness and its reach and it's, whether it's, it's a growing phenomenon in New Zealand. Um, we'll be going on a site visit to Omaru on the 28th of October with our colleagues from the National Emergency Management Agency um, just really showing, you know, waving the quake call flag because we see this as a really important national initiative um, to build awareness and to um, and preparedness, particularly in the schools environment. As I mentioned, in recent years there have been a number of um, new developments in this space. Um, it's our fault has, has been around for for quite a number of years, and and Devora, and then more recently. Uh, East Coast Lab, Life at the Boundary, and um, AF8 kick-started within the last five or six years. Even more recently, we've had the Taranaki, um, transitioning Taranaki to a Volcanic Future program, and the most recent is RSET, which is um, a, a program led by Bill Fry at GNS Science, Rapid Characterization of Earthquakes and Tsunamis in Northland. And so one of the most powerful messages, I suppose, from this slide is that we now have national coverage um, across uh, across the motu in terms of these these initiatives kicking off um, their co-creation uh, initiatives they're working with communities uh, to build resilience and I think this is it's it's really impressive to see that these things have now gone right across the islands um, across New Zealand and you know from a global perspective it's really exciting I think we're we're showing that we're world leading in this space we're, we're developing best practice and and, and the engagement work that we're doing um, and so where we see a lot of opportunity here for DT4 to work alongside to collaborate with and, and align a lot of act, our activities so that we're um, doing research on these boundary organizations and continuing to learn lessons and improve the way we do things. Uh, COVID presented some interesting challenges um, from an AF8 and East Coast Lab perspective last year in terms of not being able to get out on the road and get face to face. And so there were some very creative uh, solutions that were developed by Alice Lake Hammond and Kate Borson. You can see the two of them in the top left of the screen there. They are the program leads for their respective initiatives, AF8 and East Coast Lab. And so rather than uh, you know, having to cancel our AF8 Roadshow last year, um, they took it online. So they developed two social media campaigns, this one uh, in collaboration with uh, the Earthquake Commission um, called A Lot on Our Plates, obviously plates being a, a play on words for our plate boundary. And so, um, oh, sorry, something's going on with my watch. Um, 
And so this was one of the initiatives they developed, um, which was an online science um, Q&A, so a live Q&A. It was part of a, a campaign which built up to this event where people could ask questions that they would like answered by the scientists. And so for the weeks leading up to this event, uh, there was a lot of online activity asking questions, which Kate and Alice uh, uh, put together and then posed to us on this evening. So it was a really wonderful event uh, getting together and it was very interactive, you know, uh, people's questions were answered, uh, they could also ask questions in, in real time as well. And um, it's a testament to the science community really getting behind these sorts of initiatives, making their time available and getting a lot of, um, you know, positive benefits from it themselves personally and for their research programs as well. Here's another uh, screenshot from A Lot on Our Plates, which was um, in parallel with What's on Our Plates. This one was uh, a, a Twitter, well, a social media campaign, again, focusing on the plate boundary. So the Alpine Fault and the Hikarangi uh, subduction zone. And again, just providing opportunities to enable dialogue, to ask questions, to have scientists respond to their questions online um, in quick, quick fire responses, not waiting weeks to hear back from someone. So it was really, again, a big shout out to the scientists involved here who made themselves available and were able to respond quickly to these sorts of questions. And again, drawing and collaborating across AF8 and East Coast Lab here to really draw attention to those bigger plate boundary related issues. Um, making it a national focus. Sending really very clear uh, communication messages around some of these term, terms that, you know, we all take for granted, but there's a lot of um, uncertainty about what these, these words mean in the general public. And so trying to break down into nice sort of uh, simple messaging around what magnitude and intensity actually mean. And again, just enabling a lot of conversation about these sorts of things as, as, um, as people interacted with the campaign. The other thing we've really learned, I guess, and it's been underlined by the AF8 um, science scenario using the animation developed by Brendan Bradley and his team. And this, this is a, a, a based on his animation. This is work done by ABC International this year. Um, they, the, their interest was sparked by the new probabilities, um, the, the new research published by Jamie Howarth in uh, Nature in April this year. And so they did a piece on the Alpine Fault and they used the an animation from Brendan to develop their own uh, version of it. And you know this, this particular science tool has been incredibly powerful for engaging people in the conversation about, about AF8 uh, risk. And so this is, um, you know, we, we need to do better and to do more of this kind of visual communication about the about very complex science because it helps people to sort of go on a journey to understanding their local hazard risk. And I think uh, this this image in particular, uh, people across the South Island can sort of see where they sit. They can see where the greatest intensities are going to be felt from an alpine, you know, a scenario earthquake on the Alpine Fault. Of course, it won't be like this on the day. Um, specifically because it'll be something different, but it gives them the power of the hypothetical to understand uh, how they might be affected. And it really uh, has stimulated a lot of activity in terms of getting better prepared amongst the community and, and a lot of public agencies as well. The AF8 Roadshow, again, this is another resilience building tool where it's very much face-to-face -face and interactive. So scientists going out into communities across the South Island uh, working in, on a school's education program. So at every one of these locations across the South Island, there's a school's uh, um, program that is run. And then in the evening, it's a public science talk. And there's a lot of sort of media about this in each of those communities. So it gets a lot of coverage. Um, we've had really great, um, a great splash, I suppose, in terms of the numbers that we've reached on the AF8 Roadshow. This is the second of these. So in 2019, we visit, visited 12 communities. And so you can see sort of 3,000 or so people having direct uh, involvement in the roadshow in terms of coming to the school, be, you know, school students and the public coming out to these talks. And so we do a lot of, Alice Lake Hammond runs the roadshow. She, she covers a lot of miles, seven and a half thousand Ks. <laughs> and again, the scientists that come out to, to take part in this, it's a great vehicle to share their science. It's a great vehicle for our research programs to put the spotlight on some of the new and emerging science that's coming out in these areas, particularly in terms of the impacts and consequences of uh, major events like an Alpine Fold earthquake. 
And it really helps people to understand, again, their local context and how they can be part of the conversation in their communities to build preparedness. The next phase of work from a science perspective, science co-creation perspective and AFA have been uh, regional hazard workshops. And so this was uh, in Christchurch a few weeks ago where uh, civil defense and partner agencies came together with scientists to have a conversation about what an AFA scenario means for their region. So we're breaking it down now into a regional focus rather than the South Island wide focus, which has always been the scope of work for AFA. Now we're diving down and helping them understand uh, from an emergency management perspective, what these, uh, what the scenario um, Alpine Fold event means at a regional level. And again, that really helps to, to build that local knowledge. It's, it's, it's coupling science with local knowledge and helping uh, build a picture of what this event might mean. So again, there are lots of opportunities to wrap research around this from a, a social science perspective in terms of the benefits of the, this kind of approach where, um, where we're very much co-creating and it's conversation between practitioners and researchers and policymakers. Now this, um, another opportunities uh, in Quake Core 2 is, is the, what we're calling the CEE program, Communication, Education and Engagement. Now this is very much um, at the coalface of how we communicate within, within Quake Core, how we reach out and do engagement with schools and, and other things. It's also about our um, emerging researchers within Quake Core. So you'll see quirks at the right hand uh, side of the, of the slide. Quirks are, are the emerging research, researcher chapters within Quake Core. And so uh, CEE, which I happen to be the, um, the associate director for, is really an, an initiative where um, it's very much the practice of how we engage and communicate and work on education tools and products uh, based on Quake Core research excellence. And so our guiding principle is sharing research to build collective understanding of earthquake resilience that enables diverse communities to take action. And so there are, again, opportunities to, to wrap research around, around this. And so we have um, the, uh, some examples from Quake Call One of, of some of the amazing work that was done, particularly in schools and in um, you know, engaging with, with groups and agencies um, Brandy Alger, uh, who's our engagement coordinator, has been amazing at reaching out, developing uh, uh, products and things to engage with, and Papa Woody and Quake Craft and Quake Scape are, are some of the uh, projects that, that, develop, that uh, Brandy's been developing. We're wrapping AF8 and East Coast Lab and the other hazard initiatives in here to, to again, leverage opportunities for improving the way we engage and outreach our science. And so, yeah, again, there are opportunities for, for the practice of doing this to actually inform some of the research we're doing. And we really welcome um, anyone who'd like to contribute in the space to take part, either within the education and engagement space or to do research on evaluating and understanding the success of these sorts of programs. And there are opportunities to, to, to take part. And um, what better opportunity than uh, through the RFP, which Quake Corps just um, put out recently. So the request for proposals is due on October the 15th. And uh, so if you, if during the course of the last half an hour or so, if you've, if you've spotted any opportunities that you're, that you'd like to explore, absolutely give us a ring and we can have a chat about it and help you develop a, um, a proposal that might uh, complement the, the work we're doing on DT4. Um, so there's not a huge amount of time, but this isn't a, a very long proposal. You can you can rest, you can wrestle one of these up pretty quickly. So yeah, do give us a ring if you'd like to have a chat about those. And also recently the the PhD scholarship um, call was was um, sent out as well. So if you if you haven't heard about this, heard about this, also do on the also do on the, um, another opportunity. Um, just to, to put it in front of you, I guess, at the moment is the annual meeting in December, which obviously was postponed from the October date. And uh, David and I are running a lower seismic hazard zones workshop with our colleague, Mark Sterling at the University of Otago, mm -hmm. um, because we're working on a, a number of projects uh, aligned to this, this theme of lower seismic hazard. David and some of his colleagues are working in the Auckland space and Mark Sterling and I have Quake Core, sorry, um, Earthquake Commission funding to work in the lower part of the South Island, which are our two relatively lower seismic hazard zones. And there are lots of issues to discuss. And so we're looking forward to hosting a workshop at the annual meeting there. And if you're interested to take part, then let us know. 
And yeah, that's that's about it from me. I'd love to hear your questions and thoughts on this. Um, also, just putting up there um, that on October the 1st uh, is the next Quake Core Seminar, which uh, Rick Henry from the University of Auckland is going to be presenting on disciplinary theme too. So we have another uh, wrap up of ideas that are coming through on one of the other disciplinary themes to share with you. Um, so that's that's it from me. I'm going to stop sharing now and, and, and uh, look for questions. Can I just invite, if they would like to, the one thing we didn't describe for a slide is the work that Paul Miller has been doing for UC Seismic. So that's mm -hmm. part of DT4. And maybe I invite Nick Horspo if he wants to add some more around his pioneering work around earthquake injuries. Just give them a plug because I didn't have a slide for you, but your work are leading to really important strands and new strands of this work. So maybe Paul, do you got a minute to mention something? Yeah, absolutely. Um, kia ora koutou. Uh, really good. Thank you for those presentations and, and great to be able to talk oh, to you all. So, please. so, so um, as many of you will be aware, back in about 20, early 2011, we started building um, Seismic as a place to collect images, stories and media about the Canterbury earthquakes. And we've got a few hundred thousand digital objects in there now, and they range from um, uh, print quality, full text PDFs of um, all of the, the stuff, mastheads to thousands of photographs to various types of stories. Um, the biggest research project we've had going is our quake box, which we sent around Christchurch and environs uh, in uh, 2012 for about uh, seven months and collected 750 earthquake stories and, and high definition video. And we were originally just using those to collect stories, but also to um, do some linguistics uh, research through the New Zealand Institute of Language, Brain and Behaviour about the way that... Um, people talk about and, and respond to disaster and traumatic events. Um, that has since become um, a Marsden funded Quake Box 2 project, which is a longitudinal study of post-disaster narratives where we went back and re-interviewed 150 of those original 750 uh, uh, participants and asked them to retell their story. And so we've current, we've just appointed an, uh, an excellent um, postdoc uh, who is trapped by COVID in New South Wales. Um, and uh, he is doing some discourse analysis to look at the way um, people talk about the same event um, after an interval of seven years and the, to get an idea of, you know, what types of things crystallize and the way that narratives evolve and the way that that might be related to political or socio-cultural um, influences. So um, that research is ongoing. And I guess the thing that's come out of that that interests me in which we're currently um, getting a team together to look at further is um, something that I originally called the, you know, the, the post-quake diaspora, the sort of the, the invisible first world refugees with the resources to, to relocate out of a disaster zone and restart their lives. And um, it was a shock to me to realize how little we really knew about those people. You know, sometimes we just knew that there were, there were thousands of them and there was an inflow and an outflow, but we don't know where they went. We don't know how they're doing. We don't know whether they're better or worse off financially, whether they still have any psychological or other types of, of scars and how they are coping with all of that. We know a lot about the people who stayed, but we know very little about the people who left. And it seemed to me that in a, a century of, you know, potentially uh, more and more um, extreme events that these types of relocators were going to become a bigger phenomenon that we needed to understand and that we needed to allow for. So um, uh, we're currently looking at doing that and we're um, still developing the Quakebox 2 project and we're in the process of um, uh, studying things at the moment. And, and, and something that occurred to me while, while David was speaking was... Um, uh, when we talk about earthquakes, we, we tend to, I mean, I guess for me, you know, people talk about the Napier earthquake or there was an earthquake here or an earthquake there. And I was sort of naively assumed until I experienced the Canterbury quakes that these were sort of pretty much one-off events. 
um, the thousands of aftershocks and the, the hundreds of felt aftershocks was something that I hadn't planned on. And I wonder whether we make a distinction between initial events and, and later events, because I think, you know, some people might up sticks the moment a big quake happens. Other people, it, you know, they get worn down and eventually it's after, you know, the, the 20th aftershock that's closed the kids' school or something like that, that, you know, they start to consider whether this is absolutely right for them. So um, uh, whether there's scope there to, to understand what's required in that form of resilience and, and how we adapt to the long tail of, a, of particularly an earthquake um, uh, scenario. Um, is something I think I'm interested in, in looking at. And um, it's one of the things that we're um, analyzing in the two corpuses we have from our quake box work, which is, you know, how do people talk about the long tail of the earthquakes and uh, how do they um, respond to those impacts on their community? And, and also all the other things, you know, if you're, if you're in an area that um, you get moved out of after a year or so. So um, that's where we're at. The, the idea with Seismic is that it's um, intended as a free open access research repository for anyone who wishes to use it. Um, we collected very widely with no other intention than to try and gather as much stuff as possible for people to dive in and draw stuff out. And so um, one of the things we'll be looking to do at some stage in the future is um, give a few seminars on what's in um, Seismic, um, particularly in our our quake studies repository, how it can be useful for people um, and ways in which it might link into your research and you might be able to pull useful things out of there. By, by my last count of, of various types, we've got almost 2000 different types of interview available in Seismic, for example. So there's even just an, an, a significant corpus there that people might want to sort of look into and, and maybe see whether it relates to their own areas of research and activity. I'm happy to take any questions now or maybe when we give a presentation on what we have there. We're going to invite you, Paul, probably at our next meeting or one of the next meetings to actually give a seminar about unlocking seismic for Great Core and, and wider research. So, but yep. happy to take any questions. Mm, yeah. I think Jordan might have had one. Go ahead. Right. Am I off mute? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can hear me? Yep. Yep, great. Sorry, I didn't even realise I had it off mute the whole time. Um, is it, um, with Paul's comment just there about uh, multiple events, post events and so forth, and the breaking point of people's, um, I guess, emotional and uh, re resilience, have you considered yeah. looking at, I know this might sound like a very small event, but the recurring... COVID lockdowns mm. and when people went, and I'm, I'm, this is an Australian example, of course, Melbourne. Melbourne became such a crying point that people left Melbourne to move to Queensland. And it's, it might not seem much like much, but because it was recurring events, there was a breaking point. So I was just wondering for Paul, if there was something that is going on in research that might be comparable because although it's not a disaster, in my opinion, it's a a different type of event, the stresses of one more, just one more. And when people turn that point, that was just something that Paul just triggered for me mm -hmm. um, as a comparison. Yeah, that's one of the things we are hoping to look at in what we're calling the diaspora research. So thanks to Quake Core, we've just finished a, um, a, a, a literature review of what we know about relocation and relocators. There is quite a bit out there, but it's small sample and, and it's, um, sporadic and so um but it's exciting to see what's there and and our next step is we're we're, we're going to look towards uh um trying to get a, a a significant online questionnaire open to participation by anyone who considers themselves a, a relocator from the canterbury earthquakes and uh we'll start pulling those together and then hopefully the third part of that phase will be to move on to interviews with a, a quite large number of those people in order to understand um, why you went, when did you go. Some of the things we've already discovered, for example, we've discovered that um, mothers with young children um, are, are more likely to, to, to leave and relocate. So we haven't looked further into that, but we, we do know that that's an issue. Um, and I think that for anybody, you know, managing um, your, how, how your children experience the event. And uh, we were talking about this yesterday in another meeting, um, you know, how, how w w with my children, we, we made a game of the, of the 
of the um, aftershocks, you, you would immediately sort of the, they'd all have to try and guess what the magnitude was and where it was. And then one of them got to go and look on GNS and say, oh, yeah, no, it's 10K off the coast. And it's, it was a 3.5 and it was 20 kilometers deep. And, you know, those, those sorts of things were effective, um, but only to a certain extent. You know, there, there's, a, there's a time at which you think, oh, hell, I've just moved to Queensland. I've had enough of this. <laughs> Yeah. Just throw in a, fa or a, a fact that when the schools closed at the Canterbury earthquake in 2011, um, Ministry of Education required all New Zealand schools to take this place to, to register any child who had been moved out. So they were closed for six weeks. 50% um, of all New Zealand, 50% of New Zealand schools had one or more child re-registered with them. So although many returned when the schools reopened, not all did, so that created some of the diaspora, but my son was in Wellington, so about half of New Zealand children were experienced these refugees, if you want to use that term, and I use it with mm -hmm. caution, who registered in their school. So the lived experience of the Canterbury earthquake was dispersed throughout the country, often through the lived experience of children who would share it within the school context. So we had, now the Ministry of Education has good data, so we know exactly how many and where all of those children went. So about 9,000 re-registered in other schools. The vast majority of them were in the Canterbury region, but as I said, from from Northland, even Pitt Island School had two children. And mm -hmm. so from the Chatham Islands to, to Stewart Island. So the children of New Zealand were spread in the six weeks after the earthquake across the entire country. And we know to at least 50% 50, 50 of New Zealand schools. So that there's probably even more research around that. And many of those mm -hmm. children are now adults now. So they, that lived experience, uh, many of them will have anecdotes and stories about that. We certainly know some of the institutions do about what impact it had on them having these children in care and yep. the responses. So just there is still a lot to be learned, I think. Much of it has been under-researched and so there are many opportunities. And I think the work that Paul has done and his team and, and now aligning it with Quake Corps gives us some immensely powerful opportunities for some really good research. So I'm sure we would all be happy to discuss with any of you how you might link in or what could be possibly done. Mm. I'm gonna ask Nick, are you on line, Nick? <laughs> oh, sorry, I've got my son's Lego background. <laughs> Don't ever apologize for Lego. Carry on. <laughs> oh, I'll keep it on anyway. It's, you know, the toll of having kids use your Zoom. Um, yeah, so I'll just give a quick summary, David, then of the injury research. So under Quake Core 1, um, I guess myself and another, another Quake Core researchers utilized some of the medical records from the Canterbury and Kaikoura earthquakes, um, as well as the Cook Strait earthquakes that came from ACC data. So recording... Um, uh, medically treated injuries and fatalities from those earthquakes and uh, what we've done with that data is um, there's been some follow-up surveys as well of those people were injured to gather sort of further information that's not available through ACC and we've managed for the Christchurch earthquake to take a multidisciplinary point of view of looking at causes and context of earthquake injuries where we've combined it with engineering data from um, damaged buildings and and the like uh, with behavioural data and what actions people took and how that influenced their, their injury risk or potential, as well as uh, combining it with seismological data, so things like duration and intensity of shaking, to really sort of understand what are the key drivers in different settings, so workplaces and, and homes. Uh, but some of that data is quite limited because it's um, it's it's observational. We're sort of taking advantage of of, um, of medical records. So in Quake Core Two, we're sort of pivoting a bit to take an experimental approach, and this is where Lauren Vanell and Lucas Hogan from University of Auckland are also uh, working together with myself, where we're we're going to be looking and setting up experiments with uh, an, an earthquake crash test dummy called Eddie, where we're setting up uh, Eddie with some force and acceleration sensors. And we're then going to look at uh, the injury risk from being hit by 
typical uh, non-structural elements like ceiling tiles and um, and other equipment, as well as uh, the likelihood of injury from falls. Um, and then uh, we're also going to sort of take a similar approach with some of the behavioral data, which Lauren might like to comment on, where we'll plan some experiments around um, human behavior and trying to understand um, that from a more of a controlled environment from comparing it to say some of the observational data that Lauren's looked at as well. Thank you. Lauren, did you want to comment? It's optional. <laughs> sure, might as well. Um, good day, everyone. So as Nick mentioned, um, we've got a pretty cool interdisciplinary little team going, trying to understand the best way we can reduce earthquake injuries considering the human environment engineering interaction, uh, which is really cool. So I'm obviously bringing in the human part of it. So I've worked with uh, Julia, like David mentioned, evaluating the shakeout drill that we've been running in New Zealand for the last few years. And we, we've got pretty good evidence from that, that participating in the drill does teach people what they should do and people who participate in the drill are more likely to use drop, cover and hold in an actual earthquake, which is really great. Um, there's obviously a bit of room for improvement, but you know, it's an iterative process. But then when we look at CCTV footage, so for example, um, Emily Lambie and the team at JCDR looked at CCTV footage from Christchurch Hospital during the Canterbury earthquake. And I had a bit of a look at some CCTV footage from Wellington Airport during the Kaikoura earthquake. Uh, people were not drop covering and holding. They weren't doing what we would want them to do. So that's, um, that's why it's good to bring in different types of data because what people tell us they do in surveys doesn't always reflect what they actually do in real life. So it's important when we're thinking about how we can maybe design buildings, non-structural elements to protect people better. We need to consider not just what we would want them to be doing, but also what they're actually doing. So we can, we can make some recommendations, for example, from the Wellington airport footage based on what people were doing, how the non-structural elements like like seating could have been designed better to protect people based on what we know people are inclined to do during earthquake shaking. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's a cool project. It's fairly early days, um, but I think it's going to have some really cool outcomes. So we're almost at the end. Have we got any final questions before we sign off? Can I ask you a question towards the, um, that uh, behavioral um, element of how people behave in an event around non-structural elements. How, is there any research into industry actually taking note of university testing, learnings, innovations and so forth and the market actually taking up these innovations as opposed to what the market tries to deliver as opposed to what the industry actually needs, what people actually need? Is there any research in that area? Sounds like an amazing research project. Uh, yeah i'm not i'm not aware of anything i think it's part of why we're trying to be collaborative in this project so that it's not just me as a social scientist who studies psychology going to engineers and architects but you know me and nick and lucas who's an engineer producing these results considering different perspectives and um, different types of understanding so that hopefully we can make a much stronger case when we go, like you say, to, to industry? Mm, I've, just, I've done some research. So I was part of some research with UC uh, in, the, in the test lab um, for non-structural. And uh, about three months later, after we re released some of the, the results, it was very interesting to see them go, oh, you must be getting amazing take up. It was like, no, no one cares unless they own it. So there's, a, there's kind of a, uh, was it safety as imagined work as imagined versus work as done there's a that's a great innovation but if we don't own it we don't want it and if there's no pressure if there's no pressure not enough pressure across industry you have to promote across so many different influences to get it to the point where people want to even oh we'll take it up now so i, I feel like there's a disconnect between good best practice and what the industry actually foresees as their minimum they need to do. The minimum is whatever the person who's signing the documents off expects to see. So I feel like there's this 
big gap. And also, it, it, yeah, there's a there's such a focus on earthquake. I'm worried about passive fire and other things that get damaged in fire in, in earthquake. That there isn't actually any testing of post earthquake movement and fire testing. So there's all these gaps. But unless there's funding, it's never going to happen. But the funding, it's great that we do the testing, but it actually getting applied in industry, mm. it's a it's a choice. It's a real choice. And it, it's a real, I'm with um, the AES, Australian Earthquake Engineering Society. And we hardly have anyone who's specialised in this, in this area. But we always find it a bit of a, a disconnect between what's made it to market and whether it's actually been tested effectively it's driven by manufacturers. And this is where we end up with Grenfell Tower. It's not in my interests. It's not in my KPIs. And the KPIs you guys are developing around injury are going to continue to be the same unless there's a delivery model where it's really being drilled down and going, is there high levels of scrutiny of products that come to market? And are the, are, are the innovations being taken up? So sorry to throw a spanner in the works, but this is my internal burn that I see when I walked through Burwood, Burwood Hospital in Christchurch in 2014 or 2015, I walked through going, guys, this is all wrong. And I'm like, I'm just an Australian who knows how seismic design and non-structural elements work, and you're not even doing it here. And it was just this small world of, I don't know, I feel like people will do more marketing than they will uh, research. And that scares me. That really worries me that society is being left exposed and everyone's making great efforts, but yeah. So I'll, I'll back off now, but that's my, that's my ex lived experience. No, thank you very much for that. And I think that's one reason, yeah, we exist as Quake Core to address these difficult problems. So don't stay silent, please. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions, comments, or any highlighting things? that we could do or think about, so. Uh, David, if I may, um, Jordan's comment about ownership makes me think of this question. Um, I, I don't know if the public is necessarily aware of it, but of course you are, that the building code as it is today doesn't necessarily guarantee uh, functionality after the earthquake. It, it's meant to uh, at least reduce the probability of collapse. So I wonder if you went to the owner, the person buying a house or an apartment and told them or asked them how much are they willing to pay extra? What percent of extra money would they be willing to invest so that they, the house is, uh, has reduced probability, not only reduced probability of collapse, but um, increased chance to remain functional uh, and, and to, to put it in sort of clear terms one could say how much money would you be willing to pay extra mm -hmm. to keep using your house right after the earthquake not have to be vacated yeah that's a great great point thanks yeah. hi i'm um, i just thought yeah. i'd quickly jump in. Um, I'm from Resilient Organisations and uh, Charlotte Brown and a team of us are actually looking into societal expectations of buildings. Um, so that's an EQC funded project with NZSEE, um, which is running at the moment. So we're going out doing focus groups around the country starting Monday. Um, so yeah, we're asking all those sorts of questions on functionality, life safety, and what are some of the priorities uh, around building so that's an ongoing project at the moment and that sounds as it might align nicely with ip2 the interdisciplinary program too i think which is about residential housing um julia becker is the co-lead of that um i noticed that Anne marie kia ora, um you unmuted for a minute do you want to say something <laughs> oh uh, Ka karanga hia maua mai te puku o te ika o ngā te tuwhiritoa tēnā koutou. Ko tēnei te wao te wiki o te Māori, te reo Māori. Um, he pātai mō koe pō. Um, one of my pātai is, um, there's been a lot of research based on um, haukuranga o tangata whenua who were based on at marae um, that were... Um, 
I guess, doing the kai tautoko, the afi, uh, post uh, Christchurch earthquake. Is, is there much on, like, you, you spoke about, um, I guess, the migration. And for us here in Tuwharito, a lot of our whānau that were already down there um, returned, but um, also with them, uh, based at one of the kura kaupapa, um, a lot remained to rebuild. But when we were down in Christchurch, the last time we were there, we were one of the kura kaupapa, and they would love to be a part of um, any research. And nobody... And they said nobody's really come to see them to ask, you know, the effects of them as a whanau and how they work through it. But yeah, mm. kahuri ki aku, kia ora. Kia ora. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. Um, there is some research. There isn't enough. There's been some some very good research. I think possibly done by Simon Lambert. I'd I'd have to go back and check that. Um, within the Quake Core Two research, there is a specific section on Maori experience, and I think of our of our first corpus. I think we interviewed forty um, people who identified as Maori, and I think at least six or eight of those interviews were, were in Tereo. Um, and we've gone back to I think we've re-interviewed eighteen to twenty of the the, the uh, Māori participants. So we do have a good data set. Um, unfortunately, our, our um, Māori postgrad student for personal reasons had to leave that part of the project. So we are looking at um, uh, taking that research to um, uh, another team. Uh, but what is there I think is important. And um, I, I mentioned very briefly at the Quake Corp conference, um, one of the most remarkable interviews and now series of interviews um, in the whole corpus um, is a, a, a quite amazing um, manawahine named um, Tracy Taya. Now she's Tuhoi uh, and she had um, gone home after the earthquakes and then returned to Christchurch again simply because she found <laughs> it impossible to explain to anyone at home what, what it was actually like. And she found she needed to be back there. Um, and she downplayed her experience on the, 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 the day of the earthquake because not only did she save the life of a dairy owner um, and handed her tamariki over to um, some kids standing nearby so she could go and, and pull him out. But she then um, got someone else out of a car that a wall had collapsed on and she then jumped, jumped in a, a um, a, a van and went around a whole lot of Kura and was sort of busily helping people. So there's some fantastic stories there. Um, there, there. There should be more and there could be more. And I think one of the really interesting things when we look at, you know, any form of diaspora is going to be um, the, the difference between um, uh, Māori and, and, and non-Māori about, you know, where, where you go and where you feel you belong. And so I think that could be a really powerful part of that. And, um, uh, and, 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 and an area that we're, we're going to really need some support and expertise on because we, we know our team's limitations. Kia ora, we'd love to help because I know when engaging with our whānau, especially on marae, we operate more by pakiwaitara, you know, the storytelling aspect. Yeah. Um, and when you, you've heard of the stories of what's happened, then a wider engagement starts to happen, more communication starts to open. So, yeah, we'd like to jump in and wherever we can offer and help with whoever and wherever, especially to do with anything on the Māori. Kia ora. Kia ora. Well, ngā mihi nui kia koutou katoa. Thanks so much for all the whakaro and the um, kōrero around this. It's fantastic to have you all involved and Look forward to seeing you all again soon. Take, um, take care, go well, and see you next time.